today's event we'll be discussing the issue of um, effective cooperation between the, the four governments of the current UK after Scotland's independence referendum just two months from now. This is the second in a series of events. Um, here we had um, representatives of the three unionist parties here two weeks ago to discuss their respective visions for further devolution. Some of you may have been there for that event. Today we are delighted to have uh, representatives from the Scottish National Party and from uh, Plaid, as well as um, a speaker from um, Northern Ireland, who I'll, all of whom I'll introduce shortly. Um, before I do that, just to mention this project is um, being held in partnership with the ESRC and the uh, Future of the UK and Scotland programme being run from Edinburgh University. So just to uh, register our thanks to them for their support. Um, so the format of the event will be um, fairly standard. Each of our speakers has been asked to speak for uh, 10 minutes or so, um, and there'll then be a period of discussion and Q&A with the audience. Um, our first speaker will be um, Pete Wishart, sitting to my right, who's the SNP Member of Parliament for Perth and North Perthshire and the SNP spokesperson for the Constitution, Home Affairs and International Development. Uh, Pete, I think you're also one of three current MPs to have appeared on Top of the Pops, um, which is another claim to fame. Um, so Pete will speak first about the SNP vision for how an independent Scotland would work with and relate to the rest of the UK. Um, second to speak will be Liz Saville Roberts, sitting to my right, who is the Plaid Cymru candidate for uh, Dwyffor Medionith. Apologies if my pronunciation is um, out. Um, and Liz will be standing there next year, of course, at the Westminster election, and that, if successful, will become Plaid's first uh, female MP. Um, Liz has also been a, a councillor for, I think, about 10 years. Um, in Wales. Third speaker will be Ruth Taylon, and Ruth is the director of the Centre for Cross Border Studies um, in Ireland, based in Armagh, but um, also with a, a presence in the Republic as well. And uh, Ruth will be sharing some lessons from the history of North South cross border cooperation in the island of Ireland and reflecting on what lessons that might offer for um, the rest of the country. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Pete to kick off the discussion. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I'm going to appeal to you to be a bit gentle with me this afternoon. Um, it was part of my rock musician responsibilities. We were performing in Speaker's House last night with the parliamentary rock band MP4, <laughs> celebrating our 10 years together and the million pounds that we've managed to raise for charity. And one of the most pressing questions in the independence referendum is what happens to the parliamentary rock band MP4 if Scotland secures its independence mm -hmm. and this member of parliament has to go back to Scotland in order to fulfil his parliamentary responsibilities and duties. But it doesn't have to concern this particular audience this afternoon. Yes, what an exercise we're doing, isn't it? It's absolutely incredible. What an exercise in participative democracy. We're asking the Scottish people to consider something huge something that no other European nation has, in, has embarked upon before. We're asking the Scottish people whether they want to become an independent nation. It's a choice of two very different and distinct futures, one remaining as part of the Westminster system or the other choice, taking responsibility for ourselves, deciding that it's the people who live and work in Scotland that should govern Scotland. This has massive implications on our relationships with the rest of the United Kingdom. It, it determines in a certain place a, a number of new cross-border institutions. It means looking at the current institutions and relationships that are currently in place to see if they're fit for purpose, to see if they will serve what will be two new independent nations and how we'll work together. So it's absolutely massive what we're doing and how, how, how this is going to impact and affect the rest of the people who live and work on these islands. I'm incredibly positive about this. I actually believe that what independence will do will give us a great new opportunity to reinvigorate some of these institutions, to have a, a look at our relationship throughout these islands, to see the things that work, to see the things that we could build on, to approach these cross-border institutions 
with a, a new sense of equality and mutual respect. And I think what Scottish independence will do in the way that we work across borders and work across institutions is to really give them a real boot up the backside and see if they're fit for purpose. And it is an exciting, transformative thing that we're going to be asking everybody to do in these islands about how we approach some of these institutions. What this is about for us, and we keep on trying to get back to this all the time, there's loads of debates, and you've, you've, I don't need to tell you about the themes that always come up. Can, is Scotland going to be wealthy enough? What type of currency are we going to use? Are we going to be in Europe? All the other stuff. All these things will be resolved and will be fixed out. What this is about for us, and we try to get this back all the time, is governance. It's about where Scotland should be governed from and by whom Scotland should be governed from. The rest of it is just debating points and fluff. That is the central point about what we're trying to do. Now, we don't have to do all these wonderful things that we do together by sharing a prime minister. We can effectively run ourselves and continue to do things together. We don't need to have David Cameron as our head. And that's the main reason that we're doing this just now. We want our independence because we want to determine and chart our own way forward. We want to secure the governments that we vote for in Scotland. We're about the only <coughs> nation in Western Europe that doesn't get the government that votes for. We've got the one Conservative member of Parliament, and you're probably tired with the joke about there being more giant pandas in Scotland than there are Conservative members of Parliament, but it's unfortunately true. There was a reshuffle yesterday. The only person they couldn't reshuffle was what we, we call the lone panda of David Mundell because he's the only Tory, and they have to have him in government somewhere in Scotland. We want to, to ensure that that ends, that we get a government that we vote, which vote for, which does the things that we feel is important in, in pursuing the agenda that we think we require as, as a nation. And we can see how that will work because we've got a devolved parliament. Where we've been given responsibility, we, we've chosen to do things differently. And so what we are asking the people of Scotland to do is look at how we run our domestic services, the things that are already devolved for us, and see how we run them better. And I'll give you two examples about how we do this, and, and one is in the health service. Where we've seen the, the health service down here heading towards semi-privatisation, what we've seen in Scotland is us sticking to the principles of 1945 and what we've embarked upon as a policy of free personal care for the elderly. That's, that fits and chimes with the way that we want to run the NHS, which is more in tune with our sense of community and our political values. That's how we would choose to run the NHS differently, and that's what we've chosen to do. The other is in education, and again, you can see the difference in our approach to try and reflect our Scottish values when it comes to how we run this as a devolved service. Instead of having academies and people running schools who hadn't, hadn't even seen the inside of a teaching qualification, what we've done instead is to ensure that young people don't pay tuition fees when they go to university. I mean, Scotland was founded on the idea and the principle of free education and it's something that we feel is important as we go forward. So where we have control and responsibility, we do things better. All we're saying is we could do the rest of the stuff better too. Like we are currently the repository for the largest arsenal of nuclear weapons in, West, in, in Europe. That doesn't sit comfortably with our sense of ourselves as a nation. We would get rid of nuclear weapons. There's also the fact that you know, like we want the, the, the powers to grow our economy, and we feel that we're unable to do that just now with what we've got. And we're also looking at a very divergent set of priorities and political arrangements. If, if you look at the combined vote for the right throughout the United Kingdom, that's UKIP and the Conservatives, that, that's ranging anything between 45 and 50% just now throughout the United Kingdom. The parties of the right in Scotland would maybe register at about 15% to 18%. UKIP came first and second in the last two national elections in the, in the United Kingdom. In Scotland, they barely scraped 10%. We're doing something different. There seems to be a divergence in the idea about what the rest of the United Kingdom want and what Scotland wants. I think we have to respect that. I think we have to say that, you know, like, we, we are going in different directions and different, different journeys here. We face a prospect of being dragged out of Europe because of the political priorities of the United Kingdom. I mean, in that, when I'm in Westminster, you, you can't get through a day without some sort of debate about the, the, the possible possibility of the UK leaving the European Union. They barely 
I never get a letter on this in Scotland. It's just, just not an issue of authority. We are happy and comfortable with our European Union membership. But yet Scotland might be dragged out of Europe against our will, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And what we're saying to the Scottish people now is the only way to ensure that we do get our European membership is to vote for independence, in, independence in, um, in September. But it's more than about all these things. It's about the impact this has on our nation. The energy, the enthusiasm, the imagination, the creativity that will be unleashed as we get down to the business of building our new nation. That when we go start to put together our new institutions and our new nation, I think it will be absolutely fantastic. It's the thing that will do to our, our national self-respect and our dignity in that very simple thing of just becoming a normal nation again, being a self-governing normal nation. I think that's going to be fantastic. We will continue to, to work with our colleagues and friends across the United Kingdom and we'll do that constructively and we will build these new institutions and we'll have, have a proper look at the things that we currently share and how that will work out in the future. What I despair about is how what we're trying to do is characterised as separation. And this is what we hear all the time from our friends in the No campaign. It's not separation we're after, it's inclusion. And I think the, the most famous quote on this comes from our, our first ever Member of Parliament, Winnie Ewing, when she said, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. That's, that's exactly what it's about for us. We want to be part, we want to be included, we want to be able to say, hello, this is Scotland, we're arrived, we're, we're a different nation, we do things different, we look at things entirely differently from the rest of the United Kingdom, and we've got a meaningful contribution to make. So that's the one thing I want to take away from you this today. We'll work with our best friends and neighbours, which is what the rest of the United Kingdom is. It's not foreigners to us. All this talk about foreigners and border posts that they continually spout nonsensical rubbish to try and scare the Scottish people out of deciding their future as an independent nation. It's not its best friends and neighbours, and it's a world that Scotland wants to get on, and with independence, we'll achieve and secure that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Pete. Um, lots of areas to explore in discussion, hopefully, there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'll now hand over to Liz Savile. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, you said, Peter, the only nation in Western Europe that doesn't get the government we voted for. There, there might be another nation as well, and I'm just here to speak on, on the behalf of Plaid Cymru. Um, forgive me, because this is the first time that I have addressed an audience quite like yourselves. I have a background in education and also in uh, local government. And I am, I'm learning my style as I go along, so I won't be quite as, 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 as fluent as, um, as Peter in my presentation, but I will do my best. And um, so the one thing that, 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 that strikes us in Wales, of course, is that the need for effective cooperation between the nations and the administrations of the British Isles is, is self-evidently significant, even as we stand now, without even looking to the future. And indeed, why would we desire anything else? What good would it suffice for us to desire anything else? Which in itself indicates perhaps that the, the political strategies that we're hearing about in relation to the referendum now from the unionist um, parties, rather than, than hard-headed policy, they are a political approach. Uh, these are the root perhaps of the recent UK government fear and panic announcements, which seek to negate the possibility of cooperation with the Scottish government following a yes vote that these aren't really a practical approach. These are just a way of, of scaremongering as, as where we are at the moment. I understand it's 64 days time, if I can count at five o'clock this morning on my Google calendar. <laughs> yeah. And I say in 64 years time, and as the Plaid Cymru representative, I would um, wish the people of Scotland every success with, with the vote and the referendum. And it is clear also that um, the Westminster government cannot ignore the need for a completely overhauled constitu constitutional settlement Indeed, it no longer, as we stand now, as I was saying earlier, no longer has the room it so to do. And such a result, such a settlement, would result in greater autonomy for the nations of the United Kingdom. Thus, in the context of both the need for better administration of cooperation and the irrepressible expectations of greater autonomy, Plaid Cymru would argue that devolution in Wales as an approach should now give, give way, give way to self-government. A possible option in this sense of self-government would lead to the people of Wales deciding how much sovereignty they would, they would cede and how much they would share and at what level. And in this sense, Wales should cease to be a spectator nation watching at the sidelines and assume the powers and responsibilities of a participant nation. 
We need in Wales to move forward from the piecemeal process of devolution, such as we have known over the last 15 years, and replace it with self-government as determined by the people of Wales. In practical terms, we propose that a powers reserve model, but with those powers reserved to Wales, it should be up to the people of Wales to decide what powers and decisions are shared with others, rather than a process whereby London hands down powers as and when that government sees fit. With that constitutional basis, the people of Wales would be able to hold a referendum on independence. The Edinburgh Agreement delegated that power to Holyrood, and we believe that the same capability should also be applied to Wales, be in the hands of the people of Wales as well. What then is the viewpoint from Wales on the Scottish referendum, and, and what say does Wales have in cooperating with an independent Scotland? Well, Ply Cymru believes that the framework for effective cooperation with these islands, to a point, exists already. And these can be developed to ensure that economic, political and social cooperation is maintained, but also reasserting democratic control within the nations at the same time. That framework is the British-Irish Council, which we perceive as the potential to evolve along the lines of the Nordic Council-style body. This would mean formalising the Council in terms of its remit and its responsibilities, and even perhaps working towards a roving presidency of the British Isles along the lines of the EU Council presidency. Plaid Cymru would also like to see the Joint Ministerial Council being reformed by, a new, uh, by means of a new Memorandum of Understanding, in which we would propose arrangements to conduct dialogue on such matters as social protection, defence and foreign affairs. And to conclude, it's clear that the Scottish referendum, whatever its result, is changing the terms of debate on the relations between the nations of these islands. We in Plaid Cymru believe that, that Wales should be central to considerations in any redrawing of the constitutional settlement of the British state. It was a Welshman, Ron Davies, who said that devolution is a process and not an event. We think that the devolution process should move rapidly forward given the events in Scotland and that devolution itself should give way to Welsh self-government whereby it is up to the people of Wales when and how far they take their journey towards self-government rather than it being the decision of the Westminster government. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Liz, um, for that <coughs> exposition of the view of self-government. Um, be, be interested maybe in discussion to draw out some of the... Uh, where, where there are differences between uh, what you mean by self-government and where ultimately the SNP thinks um, independence will lead in terms of the relationship with the UK. Um, but now I'd like to ask uh, Ruth to bring some perspectives from Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I think the thing I have to say starting out is that our centre does not take a position on the constitutional question. Um, so whatever my personal views may be, nevertheless, certainly we've, I think most people, well, a lot of people in, in the island of Ireland would find the discussion that's going on in Scotland um, very exciting, um, that there are real interesting new models of ways of doing things and certainly in terms of us developing our east-west cooperation, increasingly we're looking to Scotland to try and, and make those kinds of cooperative links and learning from each other. Um, particularly recently, for instance, we had some local government people over uh, for our conference in January, and it just changed the terms of the whole discussion around what, ki what is local government for. So I really welcome this debate, and I think, uh, as, as Liz was saying, no matter which way it goes, um, it will certainly shake things up for all of us uh, in terms of the way things are done and, and, and look forward to that. Our centre was set up in 1999 and it was very much in the wake of the 1998 peace agreement, um, the Belfast Agreement or the Good Friday Agreement. I'm not sure how familiar people are with that, but it is a bilateral international treaty between the UK government and the Irish government. And out of that came three strands, the first of which was institutions within Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Executive and the Assembly. Strand two are the North-South bodies and the North-South Ministerial Council, which is very important. And that formalized, and that's probably, I suppose, the context really for most of this discussion for us today. It formalized cooperation between the government of the Republic of Ireland and the Northern Ireland Executive, so a national government and a regional devolved government. Um, as well as between civil servants in key areas. And then the third strand 
uh, which again we've kind of had some reference to, is the relationships between the two governments, um, <coughs> strand three, so that in in took in also the executives of the Isle, Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. Um, but it's mostly strand two, which would we, we would concentrate our work within that, that framework. But the other driving um, force for us in terms of cross-border cooperation has been very much European cohesion policy. So increasingly, we're casting what we do very much within either or both the Belfast 98 Agreement or European cohesion policy. And we find that that has been absolutely crucial in terms of also changing the debate. Whatever criticisms there can be of certain things coming from Europe, certainly the cohesion policy gives us a frame where we can put things because it drives, you know, the whole ethos of that is changing uh, the gap or diminishing the gap between the more affluent country, countries and regions and the less affluent, uh, reducing inequalities and improving the potentiality of territory by engaging more actors, that is, engaging civil society. And again, the lessons from Scotland in terms of participation and looking at new ways of doing things. Um, you know, we're drawing on Europe, but also increasingly more also on the Scottish model of how that's, that can happen to really get people involved in the decisions that are changing their lives. And then also from Europe, what we take from that very much is the three pillars of sustainable development. So it's not just competition and growth, but it's also social inclusion. It's also environmental sustainability. So we can wrap kind of what we're trying to do in a, in a different ethos, a different model of, of, of uh, organizing governance and, and daily life. Um, and just to say, in terms of the North-South Ministerial Council, because that's where a lot of the cooperation has been institutionalized, and I suppose one of the things I want to kind of stress here is how important the institutions of governance actually are to make things happen. Um, the North-South Ministerial Council has been very well embedded, um, and there is a joint Secretariat of Civil Servants, and I would say the civil service level of things actually work quite well. Um, the problem we have at the moment, well, we've had from maybe the beginning, but certainly those of you who maybe are following our situation in the last number of weeks, we are back into a bit of a crisis where things have been, um, a certain veto, I suppose, has, has been imposed on terms of what's happening with North-South cooperation. Um, so although we have these bodies and they are still, at this point, still standing, um, there's always the threat that some of the, the institutions could be collapsed. Um, and to a certain extent at the moment, we're in a bit of a precipice about that. But the way it is set up to work, I think is a very good model. It's an international treaty, as I said. Underneath that is the North-South Ministerial Council, which has an office in Armagh with civil servants coming together from both sides of the border for the Joint Secretariat. Uh, they work very well together. The problem that ha they would have would be when things kind of move up the chain and the political level actually s kind of puts the brakes on things. But the institutions are there. There are six bodies that were agreed in 1998. Um, the North-South implementation bodies cover inland waterways, food safety, trade and business development, Irish language and Ulster Scots, lighthouses and some of the things around the kind of marine structures and then the special EU programs body, which again has been very important, um, especially in terms of some of the European cross-border cooperation programs, which have been very important for supporting and resourcing cooperation. Um, the fact that we are, I think, unique in that we have one body set up to administer the programs on behalf of the two governments. We started out with those, those programs being run on a kind of parallel basis, and that had all sorts of problems. And when they finally set up the one cross-border body, which is the managing authority and the certifying authority and the audit authority for, for those joint programs. Despite the, you know, it, everything doesn't work entirely smoothly, but it, talking to our European partners, we've realized just how significant it is to have that one body. And again, we would work very closely with them. There are other areas of cooperation between departments which are not, which don't have a body set up under them, but which come under the North South Ministerial Council. And that covers pretty much a lot of the main areas, agriculture, education, up to, 
to secondary level, and there's some discussion happening about whether higher education should come into that, and that may be one place where we do have some movement in the near future. The environment, health, tourism, um, there is a tourism body which helps to market, or which, which markets the island internationally, although we do still have competition between the two tourism bodies, north and south, <coughs> and transport. Um, up until 2006, and it is one of the paradoxes that we kind of grind on about quite a lot, there was something called the common chapter. And so while we had direct rule uh, with the UK government on the one side and the Irish government, built into all the policy documents, there was usually just a paragraph in the northern policy documents, but virtually every significant policy document, whether it was agriculture or transport or whatever, had a paragraph in it about north-south cooperation. And because that was there, and on the southern side, the documents were much more detailed and much more probably generous in one sense. But because that was there, it meant there was a policy imperative for cooperation. And civil servants then had a responsibility to do something about that. And it had to be built into the action plans that went with the policies, and it had to have a budget line. And what we found is that since 2006, one of the paradoxes of devolution is that that has kind of withered away and disappeared from most of the policies. And particularly with now with austerity, there's been kind of this retrenchment back where you know people are really trying to look after their jobs, look after what they have to do on their own side of the border, and that kind of has been lost. So we're very much pushing with the two governments at the moment again to reinstate that so that there is a policy imperative. And I suppose in terms of being asked about the lessons from our situation, I would say the first one is that you have to have the written policies and that is absolutely critical, even if it seems, you know, we used to criticize it because it seems so weak. But in fact, if it's written there, then you have a baseline to start from. The second thing is it has to be institutionalized because there is only so much that can happen. Um, there's a lot of organic stuff, and we would hear very often about how, you know, well, you don't need that because you've got this organic stuff happening. And people are now, it's so normalized. But it's not, you know, it does need to be built in because if it's not, it very quickly, and those of you in the civil service probably understand this, that if it's not built in there, people just don't have to do it. Their, their priorities aren't to do it, and they you know, haven't got it built into their daily work. So it does need to be very strongly institutionalized, and it needs to be resourced and nurtured, and people need to have capacity built. Um, just to say as well, the other areas that, that, it is, that cooperation is working on quite effectively, but again, that's where we see the lack of institutionalization, uh, the lack of policy from the top. It's, you know, there are barriers that can be overcome and are being overcome on a daily basis by people, what we call very often working under the radar where health authorities on either side of the border do a certain amount. But quite frequently then you hear the dead hand of the department has stopped something happening. So it does need to be built in there there's only so much that can come from the bottom. And in terms of even market forces, um, certainly a lot of business can deal across the border and cooperate across the border as if the border wasn't there. And that's fine for those businesses that are strong enough to do that. Um, quite often those who you know, have the best export records started exporting north-south before they started exporting internationally. But there's a lot of other people, um, whether it's in private sector or or local government or, or civil society for whom the barriers make it not worthwhile. So the barriers can be overcome and virtually everything we've looked at in terms of some of the work we did around health and hospital planning, um, there are lots of administrative barriers, lots of regulatory barriers. Those can all be overcome if the political will is there. And then that needs to, as I say, that needs to be supported and nurtured and, and given help um, because it won't happen some of it will happen automatically because people do that. Uh, but certainly, and, and in our case, we found that the European money and the European policy there has been absolutely crucial. Um, and that would be my bigger worry in terms of what's going to happen with UK membership and how that's going to affect things, in, rather than you know, what might happen with Scotland, I think. Um, because the European dynamic there and the European context to allow some of that cooperation to happen and the European resources have all been essential to us doing the North-South cooperation. Um, you know, if, it, if the European funding wasn't there and some other international funding, um, 
there is very little departmental um, budget funding and has been very little over the, you know, relatively speaking, over the last 10 or 20 years. So the European context for us as a broader framework to be looking outward, to be making those links has been absolutely essential. So maybe I'll just leave it there. Okay, thanks very much. Um, well, before I open it up, I just wanted to um, put something across to, to, to you, Pete, in particular, and, and Liz. Um, Ruth was referring to the importance of um, having institutionalized structures for cross-border cooperation um, as, as a kind of core lesson from, from the islands of Ireland. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more about, about the kind of institutional structures you would imagine being necessary given where Scotland and the rest of the UK would continue to need to, to, to cooperate. And, th and then, Liz, if you wanted to say a bit more, I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the British-Irish Council as a kind of building block, maybe, for a new kind of relationship. So if you wanted to expand on that as well. Yes, if, you, if you'd like to. I think um, there's very little to add to what Liz said about the, the structure and the, the institutionalised form that would require when it came to these sort of issues. Because I think the British Irish Council is a fantastic model about what could be done. And if you look at what would happen with the British Irish Council, what you'll, what you'll have is, is three independent nations, because you know, hopefully Ireland will take a, a much fuller role in that. You'll have two devolved administrations, and then you've also got whatever we now refer to as Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. So we've got all these f fantastic participants. And as an arrangement, it could work perfectly in building up these joint institutional arrangements. And we, again, we'll look at the, the Scandics and see what they've got. The Scandic Council is another example about how we could formalise some of these institutional arrangements. But in terms of what we would do as an independent Scotland with the rest of the United Kingdom come independence, it's really difficult to sort of say and, and to suggest what type of institutions would be put in place because they refuse to discuss with us. You know, I mean, we, we try to do all sorts of post-independence modelling about the type of things that we could do together, the type of working relationship and arrangements that could be put in place. But they don't even countenance the prospect of an independent Scotland. So it leads to real difficulties. And this is why we get the, to the, the situation where you know, they rule out things like the currency. They say there's issues to do with BBC, there's issues to do with the European Union. But they won't sit around the table and say, well, what are these difficulties? How do we resolve them? How do we fix them out? How do we start to put in place some of the arrangements that would actually deal with some of these difficulties, they've got a referendum to win just now. So they're not going to really be in the business and giving any countenance to the idea of an independent Scotland. So we can't really start to shape up what these institutions will look like. And this is why we said that, you know, like when we win the referendum on the 16th of September, we're giving ourselves to, to May 2016 to make sure we can get all these things done. Because we're going to have to work really quickly, given the UK government's failure to enter into any sort of um, discussion about these arrangements. So we've got that period up till 2016, May 2016, when we have our first elections to an independent Scotland now to resolve these things and fix out. I just wish the UK government would, would get on board a little bit more. I mean, there's, there's huge issues for them. I mean, the, probably the main one is, you know, what happens to Trident? I mean, we've tried to suggest all sorts of practical ways and arrangements that we could meet our obligation as an independent nation, which would be to be nuclear free. And there's obviously the requirement to hold, keep hold of this, but we can't even get them around the table to discuss this. And it's unfortunate because the Edinburgh Agreement's a fantastic piece of, you know, like writing about how two governments can work together in cooperation. And I think the Edinburgh Agreement will be the basis as how we go forward because they knew they had to do this. They were forced to the table to allow Scotland to have an independence referendum. They knew that if they didn't devolve the right for us to have a referendum, we would do it anyway. So they were, they were, they were facing a crisis point constitutionally. So when they were actually obliged to get around the table and work something out, we got a fantastic piece of work with the Edinburgh Agreement. And I think that therefore suggests that when we do secure our independence, and in that period leading up to 2016, there will be real constructive dialogue in the best interests of an independent Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, and we will manage to get these institutions and get these relationships functioning properly in place. Okay, thanks. And uh, yeah, Liz, did you want to come in? I, I'm particularly interested to hear kind of what, what you see as being the main policy areas and services maybe that might continue to be shared across the English across and Welsh the, border. 
I mean, what you mentioned earlier on as well that we that you were interested in what the, perhaps the semantics. What do we mean by self-government as opposed to devolution? Because really, I haven't got much more to say. We, we've mentioned the various structures that are in place at, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, it, it is given that we are only so many days away from the referendum, and then the time, if that is in favour, with the, the clock is ticking till 2016. One would have anticipated that a practical approach to governance would actually, well, how do we deal with this eventuality and don't just leave it till, till, till the last minute? But, uh, and, and these, we mentioned the, the, the JMC and the Memorandum of Understanding, well, they are part of the, the devolution deal as it stands with Wales, although we would be obviously interested in, 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 in readdressing the Memorandum of Understanding and the contents of that. But to come back to uh, our vision for self-governance, we need to look and you know, take the step back to compare uh, our experience over the last 15 years in Wales with, with that of Scotland, where we, we did not have the, the civic institutions to any degree that were in existence in, in Scotland previously. And there were 20 specific policy areas were devolved to Wales. And since 1999, there's been a process of interpreting what we can actually do with that. Of course, we had the referendum back in 2010 to, to if you like, conf confirm what we could actually do already as it happened, but it, 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 it moved us along the way in, in giving our confidence. And, and that is the perception with self-government, that we are, we are moving on our way away from these, the 12 areas of, that have been allocated to us. The, the, the obvious ones, and these have been discussed in, in the, the, the Silk um, uh, reports and, uh, more recently, uh, with the obvious ones say so we haven't got broadcasting, we haven't got law and order. As, which actively impacts on how we can govern ourselves in Wales. And although the term independence in Wales hasn't the, the same confidence that it has in, 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 in Scotland as of yet, when people are polling on that, nonetheless, there, there have been polls which show that if asked whether Wales should be in, in control, say, of, it, of, of, of foreign affairs, the people actually believe that, yes, we should. We're, we're, we're moving on our way, and if you like, gradually imagining the context in which we take greater responsibility for ourselves with the idea eventually that independence is actually there to make the lives of the people of Wales better, not in an end in itself, but in taking responsibility for ourselves, our lives will be better. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Ruth, I just um, wondered if, if you wanted to comment at all further on how you think the... Scottish referendum might impact on the nature of um, the institutions that you, you study, uh, the, the, the cooperation. Well, I think it certainly would give a much stronger role for the, the third strand, the British Irish side of things. Um, it will be, in a sense, destabilizing, but maybe not in a bad way. It's hard to know. Um, Whichever way it goes, I think it will shake things up for all of us and, and force us to maybe look at different ways of, of doing things. Um, and certainly the links, for instance, at other levels, not just at the sort of the top level, but already, you know, the, the discussion within Europe is about multi-level governance. And I think increasingly that's the kind of context, which is why, you know, I don't think, I think the borders can be gateways. I don't think they have to be the barriers that, that we're being kind of told about. And in fact, increasingly, they're, they're not. Um, and maybe the one area where they are is where you're trying to keep people out. Um, but certainly in terms of hands across the border at different levels of, you know, between local governments and, and civil society organizations, for instance, there's lots of good stuff happening and that could be happening a lot more if it was given a bit more encouragement and a bit more nurturing. And in that sense, that's why I think, you know, the the sort of different dynamic coming from the debate in Scotland in terms of, of what is democracy and how, you know, how do you get citizens participating in decisions. I think all of that is going to shake us up whichever way the referendum goes. So I look forward to that in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm now be very pleased to involve people from the audience. So please take your hand up. Okay, so um, yeah, if you say who you are and where you're from, um, we'll start with the gentleman there. Thank you. Um, my name is Jerry Wilk, I'm an educational services consultant. We're really just uh, three quick points for each of you. Uh, first, congratulations, great achievement for your MPE colleagues. Thank you very much. I think you have a challenge in the top line. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 
Final, just uh, really a couple of rebuke there. Yeah, <laughs> just really uh, encouragement. I think all education systems, including England, need to look around the world for best practice, what we can learn from each other. And I'd say that for Scotland as well. And um, even high performing Massachusetts, they have Sir Michael Barber commission a report. So I think we all need to look what we can learn from each other, England from Scotland, Scotland from England, and both our nations from around the world. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, We'll come back to that and take another couple of questions. Um, so, yes, gentlemen in the front here. Uh, thank you. Uh, John Ewan, I teach politics and history. And uh, having listened to the panel and also glancing over that uh, picture of uh, Martin McGuinness and uh, Ian Paisley, I I'm prompted to ask um, what would be the impact um, if Scotland becomes independent? on the Anglo-Irish um, uh, arrangements at the moment. Um, I must say, about five years ago, I had the opportunity um, at the Hammersmith Irish Centre uh, to ask uh, uh, the same question, and uh, nobody uh, really knew the answer. Now, I realise it's a hypothetical question, but I'm conscious of the fact But if, any, if anything, uh, there are probably stronger links on both sides of the community in, uh, of Northern Ireland in Scotland uh, than in England. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, gentlemen at the back. Hi, Jonathan Brecken from the Alliance for Useful Evidence, uh, a network to promote evidence across the UK. There was a my question is about the informal ways of cooperation. Uh, there was a report by Carnegie Tr UK Trust last year, uh, based in Scotland, with Joseph Rantree, uh, called Evidence Exchange, and it was about how we can learn from different jurisdictions in the UK about what works in social policy. And, and it's, interestingly, they didn't conclude that institutions, new institutions are the answer. It's like, what can we use that's already out there? But also, how do we respond to that kind of thing where, where whether you're working, say, education or social policy or public health, People are learning in the UK by, by airports in the US or, or in Europe, you know, the kind of airport effect bumping into each other. Uh, clearly that's kind of, maybe that is right. But what's your, your view on the informal ways that we can learn, perhaps as civil servants or head of charities, between what works in the UK? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we'll come back to the floor in a moment. Um, so, well, Pete, there was a sp the specific question about academies, but I, then within that, I think there's the broader point that was followed up with a third question about how the different administrations can can learn from each other. I mean, devolution is sometimes <coughs> talked about as a as a sort of policy laboratory that enables um, natural experiments. And I mean, I don't know if, if the panel think we make the most of that um, kind of opportunity at present to learn um, and how we might strengthen that. So I think there's an interesting issue there. Um, and then there was also the specific question about impact on Anglo-Irish um, arrangements and, and relations of the, of the referendum, which, um, again, was, was for you, Pete, but Ruth, you've, you may have some more to say on that as well. Um, so, yeah, Pete, do you want to go first? Well, first of all, my apologies to the gentleman who asked that first question. I, I, the poor characterisation of some of the political debate I listen to when I go to education questions and follow some of the education debates. And, you know, I mean, I think that what the point I was trying to make was that we do do things differently and we have different priorities and different ways, different arrangements. And that was the, the sole point I was making. And that's entirely right up to the um, English Education Department about how they want to run schools and the approach that they, they do. We, we've decided to do something different in Scotland. And I think that comes to the, the gentleman's question over there about learning good practice. Of course, you know, I mean, that, that, none of that changes with independence. And particularly when we have now the exciting, the, the, the exciting, like, um, Real, realistic prospect of having all these different assemblies and possibly independent nations throughout the United Kingdom. We've got, we've got four different governments or assemblies in the United Kingdom and we're all desperately trying to learn good practice from each of them. You know, if, if you think about some of the, the great innovations in social policy of the course of the past 10 years, like uh, the banning of smoking in, in public places, that came from the Scottish Parliament. I think it, it went to Wales after <laughs> that and then came to the rest of the United Kingdom. And so that, this is a, you know, like what we can do in, a, in our smaller parliaments and assemblies is, is perhaps pioneer these things. We could have a debate amongst our citizenry maybe a little bit easier with our five million or our two million 
than the, the 58 million in the rest of the United Kingdom. So we could do these things and we could learn from, from each other. And none of that changes with independence. In fact, you know, it, it, poss it possibly will even encourage that further where we can learn from each other in terms of how we would administer things like macroeconomic policy, foreign affairs, defence. Imagine being able to do things like foreign affairs differently throughout the UK. It's not a, a blanket one size fits all that we in Scotland have to just this, go along with whatever the United Kingdom decides as our foreign affairs priorities. There, there's another way of doing things, and maybe that will encourage the UK to say, the, the Scots might have a point about approaching these particular issues. And, you know, that, that's one way that we could maybe firm up the informal arrangements, if that's not a contradiction. In terms of the, the Anglo-Irish issues, I think, you know, like the, Scotland and Ireland have always been great friends. And, you know, I mean, this is, again, when it, when it comes to independence, it's a, a, a relationship that we would very much like to, f to firm up. We know there's great anxiety in Northern Ireland, particularly about the prospect of independence, particularly with the, the unionist community. And there's been some, some comments made in the House of Lords by um, unionist peers about their very real fears about what would happen if Scotland became independent and how Northern Ireland would look and view itself. And I hope that we could do much more in order to say and suggest that this wouldn't be the case. But it's not just Ireland that Scotland's looking to, to form new relationship. But we, we're, we're looking to the high north, which is a, an area that has been much neglected by the United Kingdom. We, we look to Iceland and the fantastic constitutional debate they've had with, when they went through their, their current difficulties and the way they went around responding to the, their, their almost financial collapse and the, the place that they are in now in terms of inviting the people to... to put forward a constitutional region. We're looking to Scandinavia, we're looking to Norway particularly, and we're looking around all our, our we used to have a much derided um, term which was the arc of prosperity, and then of course two parts of that arc had real difficulties, so you don't actually find Scottish National Party members referring to that, but it was a good point that was made, which is that, you know, as well as looking southward and having a relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom, there's a lot happening to are different borders, whether they're sea borders, whether that's Ireland, whether that's North to Iceland or across the North Sea to Norway. And independence will allow us to ensure that we firm up these relationships and that we make them as productive as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Ruth, do you want to come in now? As those? Um, maybe just to go back to the borders because one of the mm. interesting things I think will be, you know, we talk about cross-border cooperation, but we actually have different levels of that. Partly it's the, the relationships between communities directly adjacent to each other at the border region. And I think that will be, you know, it's maybe something we don't hear that much about in terms of Scotland and England. Um, but certainly the north of England relationship with Scotland will possibly change and develop in different ways. Um, and then we would have all island cooperation sort of between, you know, on things that, that affect the national government maybe more in the south than with the regional government and with the regional government in the north because things on an all-island basis make sense in a lot of ways. We have, you know, our entire island has the population of Manchester. So there's lots of things that actually just make sense to be done on an all-island basis. But there's a lot of work in terms of just the peripherality of a border region in terms of whichever side of the border you're on that we would also argue that very much the border region has, an anti you know, has a characterization of itself and needs to be developed and needs to have resources put into it. And then that gives us the context with working in other border regions in Europe, which share a lot of, you know, despite our history, we all have unique histories. And so, you know, other border regions have their conflict histories and things as well. So there's a lot that we are able to do because of that kind of universality that you can do when you, you frame things within the European context. And I think, again, come back to that in terms of you know, this, what might be more significant is really what happens to the European membership. Um, and that will shape things and will certainly be, you know, one of the issues for us in terms of nervousness, um, because for us, the South is in the Eurozone. Um, it's very firmly within Europe for all of the problems we've had with the banking crisis and everything else where you could be more critical of Europe. But it is there and it's very firmly within that. And so a lot of will depend to a certain extent on how that shakes down in terms of, you know, the UK membership or Scottish membership and not English membership or whatever. Um, and that will really change the dynamics in terms of how we do things together, I think, as much as the structures of governance. And just maybe to come back on the question of informal relations, what I try to sort of say, 
the informal relationships happen. They're absolutely essential. You know, certainly during the peace process, um, when the institutions at the higher level were, were frozen or you know, put into suspension, it was the grassroots work that kept things from falling apart entirely. But they will always hit a certain ceiling unless the top-down policy is there and the top-down structures are there to, make th to facilitate and allow other things to happen at the bottom because otherwise they, the barriers, some of them are regulatory and administrative and those have to be dealt with from the top down and that will free things up at a lower level. It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of stuff that does happen naturally because especially with borders being hinterlands and stuff, but I would argue very, very strongly that you need the policy in place, and you need the institutions and you need the resources and support. Mm -hmm. Okay, Liz, do you want to come in on any of these issues? Okay. I would appreciate coming in on education, if I may, because I think that's an interesting prism to, through which to consider the Welsh experience. Uh, and of course, it's one of the, the 20 areas I mentioned earlier on that were devolved from the very beginning. And um, we're talking about the, the, uh, the, the informal collaborations. And in my experience, really, they, 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 they've polarized considerably between England and Wales. That if, you were, if I were to attend, say, the North of England Education Conference, it would be discussing policy in relation to that of England in its entirety, to the point where we decided there was no point in going anymore because we had, you know, we, we, we had got, become so separate to that in Wales. And alongside though that, the experience of education, um, it's within the age of, the, you know, since uh, Labour ceased to be in power in Westminster, it's gradually become more and more of a, of a stick with which to beat. The, re the results in Wales, the PISA results in Wales, have become, become a stick with which to, to beat education policy in Wales, rather than where we should obviously be in a spirit of mutual collaboration. Because that is, it's no better for anybody for us to be using this as a political stick with which to beat each other. Um, also, it's one of those sticks that is used to beat devolution and the existence of the assembly per se, which of course is an interesting dichotomy because what we're experiencing in relation to policy in Wales is the fact that we've had one party in charge of that policy for the last 15 years, which, to speak politically, is running out of steam with its policy. And interestingly enough, I think if we were to be in power, what I would be looking at, say, is uh, greater investment in, in the training of staff, teacher training and development of staff, as we see in other countries such as Finland. And just the phenomenon as we go past that if uh, the, the, the atmosphere of constant monitoring, which we're seeing both in Wales and in England, doesn't really raise morale. And without raising morale, you're unlikely to get better results. But it's a, very, it's a very interesting area to consider the whole experience of devolution. Okay, thanks. Um, another round of questions. So um, we'll start with the gentleman in the middle at the back. Uh, my name's John Cartledge. Reference has already been made to the picture of McGuinness and Paisley. What intrigues me about it is how they both come to be wearing halos. However, my question is um, the extent to which Ireland is or is, Irish experience, is or is not a relevant or directly relevant model in the context of either Scotland or Wales. Because were Scotland to vote for independence, discussions thereafter would be on an equal footing between two sovereign national governments, or in the case of Scotland, an entity that was about to enjoy that status. The Anglo-Irish agreement, the Belfast agreement, was between a British government and an Irish government, over the heads of, but imposed on and accepted by, a devolved regime in Stormont. But thereafter, the cross-border cooperation in Ireland is primarily between Belfast and Dublin. I'm not sure to what extent London involves itself on a day-to-day -day basis in those relationships. But London is always since then there in the wings as a silent partner in this process. I don't know how easy it is for a sovereign government in Dublin and a non-sovereign regime in Stormont to deal with each other on an equal footing, or the extent to which even if it is, those interactions are compromised by the fact that some of the ministers in Stormont are willing partners in that process, and others have been forced into it against the ideology of their party, as, as the only condition on which mm -hmm. um, future devolved governments in Northern Ireland is allowed to continue. Okay, thanks. I'll give you a minute or two to <laughs> think about your response to that. And um, yes, bring in Jill from the Institute at the front. Hi, I'm a colleague of Akash, but I'm not working on this project. Um, uh, I want to take Pete's point about the 
lack of contingency or apparent contingency planning going on in Whitehall, combined with the, I think what a former civil servant I might call courageous timetable that the SNP has set itself to be fully independent by May 2016. One of the, in inverted commas, benefits of union is there is a big UK infrastructure in which Scotland and Wales can currently draw. For example, embassies throughout the world, you know, offering consular services, and if, you know, Celtic or Rangers are playing in the Champions League, they'll go and get, you know, people out of jail and ditto, uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, that sort of thing, um, which is clearly, A, would be extremely heroic to set a similar network up worldwide in that time scale, and probably actually a very inefficient solution as well. So I just wondered, you know, if any colleagues from Whitehall are here, going to watch this streamed, what would be the sort of prime areas in terms of services, regulators, etc., where an SNP government in a new spirit of cooperation uh, in uh, late September would come and say, actually, these are the areas in which we would like to develop service level agreements to do this until we have time to set up our own institution, or where we actually would like to cooperate going forward. So I just wonder what was top of your shopping list for doing that sort of thing. Okay, thanks, Jill. Good question and one at the, the heart of our project. So <laughs> thanks for putting it on the agenda. Um, a question here. Yes, hi, uh, my name's Robin Munro. I work at the Institute with Akash um, and I help to organize this event. Um, so I'm working on the project with Akash as well. Um, Jill's actually taken the first part of my question, which is the kind of key areas of cooperation. But, but my second, um, second half of my question leads on from something that Ruth said, which is about the importance of political buy-in from the top. You know, you, you, these ins institutions will not work if the politics is frozen. If Scotland becomes independent and the SNP has this shopping list of areas in which to cooperate, how will you go to Westminster as an equal and say, we want to cooperate with you on these? What if Westminster simply says, no, you know, energy is a prime example. You've got a 100-page report that's just come out from your expert working group on energy saying that you will cooperate with Westminster. What if Westminster doesn't want to? What cards will you bring to the table in that case? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think we'll have time for another set of questions. So um, there's some big issues there. Um, again, a couple for you, Pete, about where the big areas you see are, uh, there being a continuing preference to share institutions with the UK government um, and then how you would go about those those negotiations and what you would do if the UK government wasn't interested, I guess. Yeah. I'll, I'll maybe take uh, Jill's point first about the international reach and embassies. I, mean, I used to do international development for a party, so I'm quite familiar with the, the UK embassies and I do recognise and realise and would, would be the first to say and commend the work that they do and the way they do support um, UK nationals when they are in trouble. My, my team, St Johnston, are flying off to uh, Switzerland this evening to play in the first le leg of the Europa Cup, so I hope they're not going to be in need of the uh, British Embassy in, in Bern, but if they were, I know that they would be, they, they would be given excellent attention. I think we, we made it quite clear about what we want to do and achieve, and that, uh, that was just to have our own network of <coughs> embassy and international reach. We, we've targeted and we've detailed that this would probably start with about 26 nations that we feel is important that we have a, bilat a proper bilateral arrangement with in terms of an embassy infrastructure. And these are they've been, they're almost self-selecting. You'll know the ones that, you know, like will be the Chinas, the Brazils, will be the places where we have a Scottish footprint, you know, like in Southern Africa, for example, where there is a, a history and an engagement with, with, with Scottish people culturally and historically. So we all want to make sure that we build on all that. But we're already doing some of this, and we've, we, we see that through Scottish Development International. And I, I was in um, Singapore recently where we have a really effective SDI who are doing incredible things about promoting Scottish food and drink, which is now bigger than our oil sector, believe it or not, such as the success of Scottish food and drink. And so we look at them as an example of what more could be achieved if we did have this international arrangement and reach. And so we look at SDI as a, a means about what we could do more. I mean, if we could do this with Scottish food and drink, we could do this other, with other Scottish manufacturing. And for us, the idea of Scotland Embassy and what we would do internationally is all about trade. It must be predicated on that, making sure that we have got a place in these emerging nations and, and in the powerful top nations to be able to do that. So that's the sort of thing that we want to achieve. Now, 
sharing embassy with the rest of the United Kingdom, we, we would be very much into that. I don't know if the rest of the United Kingdom, and that brings me on to the second question. But, you know, like, the, the, the UK have now got an arrangement with Canada and a, and a couple of embassies in, in terms of international missions. So, you know, why not do it with, you know, somebody we've been in a, a relationship for 300 years, I mean, it's certainly something that we would look at and we would consider and something we would think was valuable. That will be up to the rest of the United Kingdom, and, and we can't force them into doing anything, which brings me neatly to Robin's point, which is, Again, just to reinforce that, we can't force the UK into agreeing with us. We've put forward in our white paper what we believe an independent Scotland would look like, how it would work, how our bilateral relationships would emerge, the type of sharing arrangements we'd like with the rest, the rest of the United Kingdom. We did this for two reasons, because we think, A, it's good for Scotland. We, we, we keep in place some joint institutions. We, the, the main one is a currency, of course. You know, I mean, I think it is quite surprising there's been no questions and maybe one on that yet. But, you know, we have said that this is in the best interest of Scotland and Scottish business. But more than that, it's in the best interest of the United Kingdom too because, you know, like Scotland's the second biggest trading partner of the rest of the United Kingdom. Why would you want a half a billion pounds of transaction costs to do business that you currently do already for nothing? So why we put forward these ideas is, is we, we believe it's in the best interest to share these institutions across the United Kingdom. Energy is great and, and you know, like we did spend a lot of time thinking about the, a shared energy market. We've got all the energy, it's all there in Scotland, you know, like we've got 25% of Europe's renewable resource. We've got the biggest oil and gas resource in Western Europe. It's sitting there, you know, you've got all the transmitters, you've got the interconnectors, you've got the cabling, you know, like, why, why on earth would we want to throw all that away, you know? I mean, they, they could say no, but why would they say no? And so, and I know that they've got a referendum to win. And to win that referendum, they've got to make sure the Scottish people are fearful, apprehensive and anxious as they go into the ballot box on the 18th of September. So they're going to say no to everything. We're not going to do this. We, these are just SNP assertions. You can't get the UK to agree with that. And we said, well, of course we can't. But let's look at this rationally. Like, you're going to be our best friend and neighbour. We're going to share a large border. We've been in a, a relationship for 300 years. How about we sit down around that table, work things out, which in your interests and our interests, and we'll all get on famously. Um, Liz, although the question was to, 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 to Pete, um, I'm also interested to hear about the plans from, from plans. Pride well, in yeah, terms uh, of um, yeah, the, the main areas yeah. where you would I mean, as, 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 as I said shared. before, we're, we're further away from that being an immediate issue in mm. Wales and that evidently the, these would need far greater discussions, but the principle of, of, of working in partnership and, and joint arrangements would need to be discussed. I mentioned earlier on the, me the mechanism of the memorandum of understanding. Is yeah. th that is where it would be recorded and discussed. I mean, there are matters of a voluntary agreement at, at present, but you know, we have the place whereby we could actually record those discussions. And, and to reiterate in some ways what Pete said, the th economic development would be the areas evidently where Wales would be interested in, and you know, what would be in the interest of Wales, we're talking about uh, our contacts with other countries, well, economic development would be the, the, the first port of call for that. <clears throat> yeah, because I mean, one of, the, one of the big differences, it's often said, between the Welsh-English and the Scottish-English border is the much higher population and cross-border activity between mm -hmm. Wales and England, and almost this sense that the, the south of Wales is integrated into a sort of economic space with Bristol and that area, and the north of Wales is integrated into the north of England. So there's a very different pattern of, 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 act, of sort of cross-border activities. There are different dynamics, yeah. yeah. Um, that probably needs a different set of relationships, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. yeah, okay, very interesting. And uh, Ruth, there was that one uh, question to you about the relevance of the Irish experience um, to the rest of the UK and the complexities of the relationship between a sovereign and a devolved administration. I mean, context. obviously there's a certain imbalance there, but when you look at what is devolved in terms of most of the relationships between departments, for instance, <coughs> in the context of Ireland, the education departments on both sides of the border work together. Health authorities work together, although maybe less so than is potentially possible. Um, the environment departments work together. We have an all-island health, um, well, I suppose this comes under agriculture, but there's an all-island health, uh, plant health strategy, animal health strategies. 
those sorts of things, which actually can't be resolved within the context of, of the jurisdictions. So I think you know a lot of it is probably very relevant, and certainly the work we would be doing with other border regions, the issues that come up, and especially um, because so much is done at regional level or local authority level in different places, actually when you start looking at the national borders in Europe, the work that we would do with, with other regions, we find that this, the issues are really the, very similar. So yes, certain things are still between the sovereign governments and our problem sometimes is that the things that are controlled by the UK government that create problems for us because of that um, maybe difference in outlook and in that sense uh, sometimes even though the unionists would be in line in terms of constitutional issues with, with the, the conservative government maybe more here now. In terms of other things which are in, in their self-interest like getting money from Europe there is that big paradox and that big contradiction because the interests of Northern Ireland are actually more in line sometimes with the Republic than they are with the UK government as a, as a whole. So that's always one of the things that we're kind of bumping up against, in fact. Um, but when you actually start looking at the work between, you know, at, for instance, the Departments of Education, um, there are issues there that are very similar. Now the education, the way it's, has been structured, the history of it can be very different, but the interests are the same. And, and there is a certain amount of work now being done on, on children being uh, allowed to go to school across the border and things because, because that makes sense within a, in a local area. So some of that, but so much, and this is where I would come back, so much depends on who the minister is. And that's where the po political leadership, the issue of, of is there the buy-in there, makes such a difference because it can be held up if there's not that will to cooperate. And maybe that would be the concern that, that would happen, that you know it will make sense at a certain level and you might ha well have, as I know there already is, relationships between local authorities across the Scottish border with, the, with Northern England councils. A lot of that will happen because it makes sense and people need it and want it. But you know if the top-down level leadership isn't there, then there will be barriers, there will be things that won't be able to work smoothly or won't be able to be overcome. And to a certain extent, then the efficiencies and effectiveness of public services, for instance, won't be there, resources won't be as well used because there isn't that cooperation, because the more cooperation there is, the more it just makes sense. Wh whichever border region you're in, I think, would be my message. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think we'll take one final set of questions, if there are some. Yeah, there's a gentleman here, there's a microphone coming, and then <coughs> a gentleman there. Okay. Okay. Um, Alec Cameron, Social Limited. Um, I'm a Scot without a vote, so, uh, so uh, as the idea of it being a participative um, democratic uh, experience is lost on me. Um, uh, my point really is, that when you're trying to create a collaboration between different um, countries, different organizations, there is often the intent to come together. Um, and it's part of a journey of coming together more and more, um, driven by the degree of interdependence. Um, uh, perhaps the example, I don't know what the Irish experience has been like, but you've, you've referenced education a couple of times in your, in your talk today. This situation seems to me work absolutely against that. Okay, it's the very situation where, where you're saying um, Scotland wants to do things differently. It wants to do things differently in a wide range of areas. Hence, why the heck are we doing this in the first place? So where is the intent, okay, the driving force for collaboration at the very point where the separation is happening? Okay, if the separation doesn't happen, um, and we're all in it together doing exactly the same thing. There's no point in having it in the first place. And where's the, where's the motivation for the UK to participate, really? Um, uh, and I'd be interested to know, it's obviously been, you know, it's a long and, and probably really tough process in Ireland. It'd be really interesting to, to, to just hear a little bit about that, because it sounds like you're, you're in the process of slightly more collaborating to come together whereas this is collaborating to split apart. That <laughs> seems like an oxymoron to me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yes, the, the man there. Uh, hi, I've got um, two questions, one for Pete and one for Liz. Um, oh, my name's Rory, I'm uh, Rory Reid, I'm from Collaborate. Um, 
Pete, uh, earlier on you mentioned in, uh, about um, the differences in the attitude to public services in England and Scotland. And um, I just wanted to ask, um, I don't know if you saw, but the public reaction to the remarks of Dr. Philippa Whitford in Scotland about how if there is a no vote, there will be no, uh, the NHS will cease to exist as we know it in Scotland in 10 years and will be completely different in England by the end of this decade. I just wanted to ask if you agreed with um, those views and how if in the event of a no vote, Scotland would maintain the different approach it has in its attitude to public services. Um, and in regards to the question for Liz, um, the Scottish Government is uh, very committed to maintaining links with Europe. And I just wanted to ask, in the event of the Conservatives winning uh, power in 2015 and hold the referendum before December, the end of December 2017, what would be, uh, what is the view in Wales in regards to the EU, because Scotland is very much in the, would like to stay from what we hear. Would it be the same case in Wales? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and then there's a lady at the end there, one final question. Hello, my name's Doreen McIntyre. I work as a consultant in health and international development. Um, another exiled Scot, I suppose you would describe me as. I'm not getting used to the idea of calling myself an expat just yet. Um, Two things I'd, I'd like to say. Firstly, your analogy about uh, being in a relationship <laughs> for a long time and breaking up and still remaining friends, I think that's one you might want to think through a little bit. It's not the first thing that comes to mind when people split up, um, but uh, the possibility is always there. But my, more importantly, th what I wanted to do was pick up on what, uh, what Jill was saying about uh, specifics. Um, what I was hearing from you was that if there's a, a yes vote, don't worry, it'll all be fine. We can work these things out in the fullness of time. I would feel a lot less worried if I, if I got a sense of some of the specifics you've talked about, the, the modeling you've done on post-independence, on things like, for example, Trident, which, which you brought up. What are these specific models that you've put on the table that presumably Westminster doesn't want to discuss yet? If you could be specific, that would, that would help reassure us. Okay, thanks very much. So um, we'll go in reverse order and then uh, take final responses from the panel. So um, Ruth, if you'd like to. Okay, well maybe just first. on the question about mm. coming together rather than splitting apart. Um, without taking a position on what, because I think it is up to the people of Scotland very much, but some things might be easier for them in terms of cooperation, precisely because they have had similar models, for instance, the health service is similar on both sides of the border. Although I think the Scottish determination to maybe hold on to the ethos of, of 48 um, is more encouraging. Um, we would have very much two very different models of how health is delivered, and yet there is still the scope for cross-border cooperation in the areas of health. And, and a lot of that is just driven by the need to do it more efficiently, more effectively, and to deliver things. But again, it's so much of of what we do is made so much easier because, for instance, we have the cross-border uh, cooperation programs coming down from Europe, which allow um, people in the different agencies to actually come up with projects and come up with things where they can work together. And health is certainly one of those areas where there has been a lot of cooperation um, very much at formal levels um, to do that. I think you know it could be very different, but I suppose the message I'm trying to give here is that you know, the borders don't have to be the barriers. They can actually be, you know, ways of bringing together regions with maybe, you know, that's why I think it could, could transform the border regions of Scotland and Northern England if that region starts seeing more in common as, as well. And again, those things start to filter out so that you're not going to just have the model of, you know, kind of Fortress England or Fortress UK, which I would hope. Um, so certainly, you know, the whole model of doing things differently, of looking towards other regions and seeing what we can share and, you know, the whole concept of multi-level level governance, I think, can be very important here because so much of what goes on isn't between sovereign governance, governments. It is between different layers and different agencies and, you know, different models. The, the energy stuff, for instance, I mean, it is true that people sort of say the reason we can cooperate on energy and in Ireland is because it hasn't come under the agreement and it's very much, you know, very much a, a private sector. Um, we have, a, you know, a single energy market now and um, a lot of that has been driven outside the institutions of governance. Um, 
but on the other hand, there are obviously things that also have to be there in terms of public policy to make to open things up and make them happen. But a lot of that is being driven kind of just by the force of, of, of the market. And what I would then argue about that is though that you can only depend on that where that really does have a dynamic so the self-interest is there to overcome whatever the barriers are. And for other people, the barriers will become insurmountable or not worthwhile, which is why you need the top-down buy-in as well. And, and unfortunately, what we're faced with at the moment is that we don't have that buy-in from all the politicians and things are being kind of stalled and stymied. But again, depending on what happens elsewhere, then devolution could change. And even if it's you know more Scottish devolution or more Welsh devolution, those things will also change the context in which we're working in and open, I think, things up for us. Um, but it's very uncertain at the moment, and so much is uncertain in terms of, uh, again, the, you know, the UK's attitude towards Europe and what happens there as well. That referendum, I think, is for us is equally important as, as the Scottish one. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Ruth. So, Liz, the specific question to you about the, the, the Welsh view on um, Europe. As regards the, Europe. But I'll yeah. also actually um, raise, raise another question. Well, Pete was asked about under present constitutional arrangements if there's a possible um, you know, threat to distinctive, um, the Scotland's distinctive approach to, to public services. I just wonder what, what, what your perception is as far as Wales is concerned, I mean, when you look at some of the big reform agendas that Whitehall is um, pursuing at the moment in welfare and, and the NHS and so on, I mean, is your perspective that that has a, a negative impact on what the Welsh government is able to yeah. do? Well, they're, they're, they are certainly in the frame when we're discussing the relationship between Wales and Westminster in that there are decisions made in Westminster which have no electoral remit in Wales, and yet they are they, they impact very much on the people of Wales, and they are they are part of the discussion that we need to have, because we have no say over them except the limited number say of, of representatives that we have in in, in Westminster, um, the welfare one being very much in case. I think that's that's fair to say. Um, just to turn to the specific issue of the the EU, um, I think it would be fair to say that there's not an uncritical acceptance of the nature of the EU as an organization as it stands, and the, you know, the general perception that it is not, it's not answerable, it doesn't, it doesn't function in an answerable fashion. But generally, and I, I mean, just to, to focus this down anecdotally now, I, I spent yesterday afternoon with the, the president of the FUW, one of the two farmer, farming unions in Wales, and they would argue that it would be a disaster for them if, if we were to leave the EU. 40% of our land is sold in, into Europe that for Wales per se, to be black and white about it, no, it would be a disaster for us. Okay, thanks. And then, uh, well, there were several points yes, to you, course. Pete. Did yeah. you capture them? I don't think I managed to get most of them. Great. Right. Okay, so go yeah. ahead. I think one of the, the most false characterizations about Scottish independence is that we're doing this because we don't like everything that the United Kingdom does. That would be ridiculous. There's things that we respect and admire about what the UK does and things that we'd want to continue to work with them, particularly when I mentioned international development. I mean, the UK has got one of the best records in the world when it comes to what it does to contribute in the work it does in international development. You know, that, that if we can't work with them on that, it's a model we'd probably like to copy again when it comes to issues such as cu culture. You know, I, I speak in, I'm a former musician. I see what the UK has done with creative industries, for example, the reach that it has, the, the fact that the UK is the top three when it comes to film, television, or music. You know, that, that's something that you know we respect and admire, and again, we'd want to be part of that and share with that. But there's things that, that we fundamentally object to that the UK does, and you know, like, and that's what it's doing when it comes to welfare policy, for example. We, we fundamentally object to the austerity programme this government's pursuing. I, I resent the fact that constituents of mine come to my office every Friday because they've got issues to do with the bedroom tax or they've been sanctioned by DA. We wouldn't do that. We just, that, that doesn't chime with our sense of community and the values that the Scottish people have. And we would never vote for a government that would pursue that. So we, we want the power and authority and control to not do that. Another thing that we would not do is to have, I've said it before, and it's, I think somebody raised it about having tried it in Scotland. I, I, I object to that. I'm not, having my, I'm not having my nation defiled with these weapons of mass destruction. I object to that. We can't get rid of them without 
without um, independence. That's the only way we could secure that. So like, there's, where there's things that we want to work with and collaborate, things that we admire and respect about the United Kingdom, we want to be in control to decide that. Now, if the UK says, we're not going to let you share that, we're, there's nothing we can do about that. We're, we're in that situation, in that position. But we want control. We've tried this. We've got a devil, devolution settlement just now where it's good. We're able to protect Scotland from some of the worst aspects of this Tory government. Not all of it, some of it. But we now need full control to take these decisions ourselves and to ensure that we get the government that we vote for doing the things that we approve of. That is what independence is about. And that's what we'll secure when we actually get this. I'm looking at the other points. Well, there was a specific question about the, the modelling. proposals on yeah. Trident. Yeah. Well, I, 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 just one other thing. I think it was, I, I think it was just the, the, this lady here that mentioned about the modelling. Now, no nation has considered its constitutional future more informed than Scotland. We gave this two and a half years. We were criticised at first. Why are you having this uncertainty for two and a half years, etc.? Everybody in Scotland's engaged in this. I go to town hall meetings, you can't ram any more people in because they want to find out more about what independence means, about the debate. We're looking at a turnout of 80% plus, 80% people turning out for an election in the United Kingdom. I chap on doors and you can't get away because people want to discuss, want to debate. No nation will be better informed about the choices for independence. And our white paper is just one of several models that are now there. There's one from a, our organisation called the Commonweal Project. There's one from the Jimmy Reid Foundation. The Greens have even started to do a model about how they would see a new green independent Scotland. We can't encourage our Labour and Conservative friends to do one because they're not even starting to countenance the fact that Scotland might be independent. But the SNP white paper is but one perspective about how an independent Scotland could operate and work. There's more out there and there's more, more going to be coming forward in the course of the next few weeks. No nation will be better informed and no nation will have debated independence more than Scotland when it comes to do this. So I reject this assertion and uh, like accusation that we're, we're not involving and forming and people don't know what the options are. We're now almost at a stalemate when it comes to some of these issues. It's the same things that come up again and again in debates. We now know what they are. People just have to make that choice. Who do you want to govern yourself in Scotland? Is it this place or is it are the people who live and work in Scotland? It's down to that now. That is the choice that people in Scotland will be making. Okay, thanks very much. So um, I think we'll draw it to a close there. Thank you all for, for joining us. And I'd just like to thank our three panellists for coming on. <laughs>